Hello? All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we know you're all very busy with matches and chairmans and games lists and everything else, so, uh, and other conferences, obviously. So, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. It means a lot. Uh, before we get started, we're just going to introduce ourselves. That way, uh, we can kind of put a name on the face. I'm Jordan. I'm from Team 1511. We're from Rochester, New York. Uh, and I've been working with ABLE for four years now. Uh, my name is Kyle, I'm also from 1511, and I've been working with ABLE for about six or seven months. Uh, hi, I'm Charlotte, I'm also from 1511, and I've been working with ABLE for about a year now. Um, I'm Kirsten, we're all from 513, and I've been working with it for a little over three years. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew, I've been working for uh, with ABLE for over a year. Hi, I'm Karthik, and just like Andrew, I've also been working for over a year. Hi, I'm Elise. This is my first year doing the Enable as well as Robotics. I'm uh, Steve Angus. I'm the adult mentor for Novi Robotics, which is 503 and um, includes some of our middle school FTC teams. So I'm an FTC team coach for 11129 as well. Um, I'm Jen Allen, and I'm the founder of EnableInTheFuture.org. And um, Enable started in my garage, so I've been um, I'm the first person to ever. <laughs> my name's Maria Scala. I'm the president of the Enable Alliance. And I'm residing in Washington, D.C., but as you can see, then I will go anywhere. <laughs> Right. So, uh, just a brief overview. We're gonna explain to you the history of Enable, kind of how how it went from something in Jen's garage to a international team of thousands of volunteers. Um, we'll go over how you guys can get involved um, and some future initiatives of Enable, and then uh, hopefully at the end we will we'll have Q and A. So if you guys have questions, you know, feel free to uh, ask. Um, and we will also have a, a hands-on activity. Yes, I completely intended that pun. Um, but we have, uh, on this afternoon, you guys will see on your tables are a bag with 3D printed parts. That's a hand, or well, a palm and fingers to be assembled. We ask that you just don't open uh, that bag yet, um, because there's small pieces in there that may or may not get lost, and if we don't have a printer with us to reprint them. Um, if you're on that side of the room, you'll notice there are two pre-assembled hands on your table. Uh, those have issues with them, so if you want to know how to fix a hand or adjust the tensioning, um, we can do that in a second. So, without further ado, we'll begin. Yeah. Okay, so you're probably wondering what is Enable? So Enable is a community of individuals from all over the world who have put aside their personal and cultural differences to come together to 3D print free prosthetic hands, fingers and arms, and to improve current levels of prosthetics. Um, they go to those who have lost limbs due to disease or natural disaster. It's made up of people of all groups of ages and walks of life. And at heart, they're just everyday people who want to make a difference and give the world a helping hand. So we're all just everyday people, and you guys can do exactly what we're doing. Alright, so how did we begin? Uh, well, I shouldn't say we, how did Jen begin? Because um, I, I wasn't there at the beginning. Um, so Jen loves cosplay. Does anybody know what cosplay is? Does anybody, anybody need that clarified? No? <laughs> cool. Uh, so one of, one of the things Jen would do was make props. And uh, at one point, she and her friend went to a cosplay convention and they made a mechanical hand, as you can see in that picture. Um, and obviously, it was it was just for fun. It wasn't intended to become a big global project. It was you know just a hack of it, just to look cool. So then, um, they posted a video of it on YouTube, and a man named Richard in South Africa saw that video and commented on it. Uh, Richard is a carpenter in South Africa, and he lost a couple of his fingers in a woodworking accident. He, and he, he'd been living without his fingers for, for some time, so he saw this video, and he reached out uh, to Jen and her friend and asked, you know, hey, can you, can you help me build a finger, or, or a couple fingers, to, uh, so I can get back into what I do? And of course, you know, they said yes, and they began to develop uh, a prosthetic finger, and that's one of the prototypes of that picture. Um, so this was a collaboration over Skype, um, over, over email, over, you know, 
know, really, they, they were quite literally on opposite sides of the planet. Because uh, uh, journalism in Washington and South Africa is a bit of a hike from Washington. Uh, so eventually they developed this, this finger, and again, they posted about it, uh, and other people saw it. So then, uh, meet Liam. Liam, uh, at the time, he was a 10-year-old boy living in South Africa, not too far from Richard. He, uh, I believe he was born without his hand, is that correct? Yes. He was born, born without his hand. Uh, and Liam's mom saw uh, the finger that Richard uh, was using. And, of course, then she approached Richard, uh, uh, Richard, Jen, and her friend, and asked, uh, you know, hey, can you basically just do this, but on a bigger scale for my son? Obviously, they said yes. Uh, so now they are, once again, over Skype, email, um, uh, and all sorts of video chats and stuff like that. They are developing a custom can for this kid. Uh, and they go through several iterations. Eventually they get to a point where um, a company donates two 3D printers. One goes to um, Richard and Liam in South Africa, and one goes to Jen in Washington. So then they can kind of project in parallel, instead of shipping things across the planet because that can be expensive and it takes a very long time, all, those, all that stuff. Uh, so eventually, Liam gets his hand, as you can see in that picture, and he's very happy. He can ride a bike now, he can pick up a water bottle, he can write with a pencil, you know, stuff that we all do every day. Uh, and of course, this was new technology at the time. No one had really thought of a 3D printed prosthetic cane. So they had the option of patenting it. And, you know, this could go for thousands if not millions of dollars and be a very nice profit off it. Instead, uh, the group decided to leave it open source. So they just put it out on the web. Um, anybody can can take it, use it, uh, they can modify it and develop it, uh, and and make multiple iterations, or if you need to customize it to a certain uh, a certain task, you can do that too. Uh, and then this, so that, that's kind of how Enable got its roots. Uh, people saw what someone did, then they took it, and they made it better. And through this community of people going through the iterative process, they, they developed uh, more advanced hands. So then, of course, uh, as Jen once told me, you can have a really pretty rock, but no one's going to care about your pretty rock unless they know it exists. So Jen would blog about it on a website, which is, uh, which is the, the roots of enablingthefuture.org. It was maybe something else, but then it became enablingthefuture.org. And there they documented the process of Richard's finger development in Liam's hand. And eventually, you know, it, it, caught, uh, it gained momentum. People saw it, you know, they, uh, more people started reaching out to them. And it, it grew, grew, and grew. Uh, OK, so a lot of people saw Jen's blog and they realized that they really wanted to help. Uh, so a man named John sent a Google Pluser, and so the Google Plus group was made for people that wanted to help, and the people that wanted to help put a pinpoint on a map so that uh, people can refer to this map and see if there's a person that's involved with anyone that can help them in the local area. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is a pretty old map. I think it says it's from June 2015 at the latest, but now there's a new map. So this is the new map, which Jen has been working on very hard. Um, and this shows all of the chapters that have gone through Jen and become official chapters. Um, so obviously we're a very big and global organization now. And then this is a map of all of the countries that hands or um, enable things have been delivered to. So um, our products, or what you want to call devices, that's the word, um, are now in 76 countries. So, uh, I, I just turn it off because no one wants to hear me breathe. Um, so how did Rolling Thunder get to enable, and of course Mark will, will share their story, um, but we're just trying to sequence it. Uh, so we started printing hands in 2014. Uh, a parent of one of the students on our team came to us and said, hey, I heard about this initiative, you want to look into it, I think it's something cool that the team could do. So we did. Our lead mentor, uh, his name is Larry. Larry came to us, 
my freshman year as was, was working, he said, hey, you want to help me with something? I thought he was going to ask me to make a part on the mill that would take about an hour and we'll be done. Uh, I ended up being involved in a four-year project. Uh, so he says, yeah, we're going to build a bus of cans. And I gave him a look like he had five heads because I'm a freshman in high school, I'm in algebra one, and I, I barely get to do that. Uh, so we continued to bring hands. Uh, we were up to, I believe, 46 currently, uh, over, over the course of those the past few years. Um, and then we took a step last year. So last year at the St. Louis Champs, we applied to hold a conference much like this one, except um, far less prepared. Um, and at that conference, we reached out to Jenna and Maria, and we said, hey, do you want to join us? We'll, we'll be in St. Louis you know, from, from now until then. Uh, would you like to come present with us? And they said yes. And that's how we met. We all met Jen and Maria. That's how uh, we became friends. So while we were in in St. Louis, uh, and after the presentation, a couple of our mentors had time to really get to know Jen and Maria and, and hear their story and see uh, what they do and how they work. Uh, and one of the things we found out from, uh, from Jen and Maria last year was about a week before the medicine champs, um, almost all of their resources had gotten pulled out from underneath them. So they had, they had nothing to stand on. So our, one of our mentors, uh, he holds in, we have, we have a leadership subteam of a few students on our team, maybe you guys can have too. Um, we, he called an emergency leadership team. Uh, that particular mentor is like the chillest guy in the world, so the sky literally has to be falling for him to call anything an emergency. Uh, but he, he called an emergency meeting, we all gathered in the lobby of the hotel, and he explained to us what he learned from Jen Maria that day. He explained to us how, you know, they, they're doing this, this, and this. Um, it's a global initiative, and they, they kind of just lost a whole bunch of support. So uh, he, he proposed something to the Asian community. He said they need um, a certain amount of funds to gain 501c3 status. Basically, what that means is it's a non you're a nonprofit organization. Um, there's, there's a fire with you and all sorts of things. Uh, and we, we voted on it. And before you even finish the question, uh, everyone's hand went up in favor, which was a really cool feeling. I can't really explain that to you, um, but it's definitely one of my favorite robotics members. So we did that. And then, uh, anyway. um, and then we moved into form more of a relationship with them. Um, so. While they were watching the competition, they were trying to come up with a name for their organization, and they decided on the Enable Alliance, which the word alliance kind of comes from first, and then the red and blue hand as well comes from the red and blue alliances, so first has a bigger impact on Enable. And they really like to embrace gracious professionalism, which is really why we um, have had so much fun with Enable, because we have similar values as we do at first. Great to see you. <laughs> so we, uh, we can go for it. Oh. So this is a brief timeline of our first few months in existence as a nonprofit and as a 5-1-C-3. The poster that you see below is the poster about Rolling Thunder. They presented this at a conference that we um, launched in December. This was the first conference that our community had had since 2014, and it was a truly global conference. So I was really thrilled that um, as part of the bedrock uh, for modeling um, the behavior of citizen scientists in our community, as well as volunteers in our community, Rolling Thunder not only gave us bedrock financially, but they gave us bedrock with the core values and behaviors of what we wanted to bring to the community. Um, we um, became a 501c3 um, in July. I began immediately working with City Polytechnic, turning the volunteer projects into an immersive, real-world experience um, using engineering curriculum and teaching it by applying everything to service learning or experiential learning. So they were doing enable projects, but they were covering everything in the engineering curriculum. And then we expanded it also to the economics and engineering class and the design classes and the mechanics classes. Um, it has grown from there to other disciplines as well. Uh, public health, um, international studies, 
some of the linguistics. So that was a huge effort, and it was also one where they reached out to Rolling Thunder and asked them to partner in testing materials, um, in um, also uh, doing checks in the hands and helping with inventory. So the experience of the students at the university is using enterprise-level software to track the global inventory of this crowdsourced effort. Um, and uh, Rolling Thunder was, was part of that. It was a huge effort. It was amazing to get that done in the fall. So we can go forward. So moving from there, we managed to um, get not only filament donated, uh, that was a miracle, a miracle story we've been trying to do for two years. Somebody donated resin. Uh, Natureworks donated it to 3D Fuel. Uh, 3D Fuel turned it into filament, and then they shipped it out of that to uh, City Polytechnic for inventory as part of proof that uh, they had correctly launched the software. Um, and then we began receiving other materials and pans and printing and other kits so that we were able to um, use that as a hub for distribution initially in North America and then um, the first distribution from there to another country was uh, hands that included hands from uh, the first uh, 1511 to India. Uh, those hands went to five different cities. Uh, one very close to Pakistan in the Northwest. Um, they went to Bangalore. They went to a clinic in Calcutta, which has launched uh, a, an effort to create a real research hub there. And then to two other smaller towns, um, one of which um, became engaged not only in developing arms and hands, but to further the growth of the Jaipur foot um, and asked us to see if we could create a 3D printable um, model of that. So that was another huge effort and helped the whole community of the Naval grow quite a lot. Uh, we were able to join the Humanitarian Passport Project. This is a um, this is an effort of 30 non-governmental organizations. Uh, one of them is you probably heard of the Save the Children. Uh, another would be uh, a lot of the efforts um, organized by the United Nations. This is their online training platform. And so we've been able to create uh, model badges for our community called digital recognitions, but we're also going to be uh, giving up the first digital credentials recognitions for this very serious set of credentials, and uh, also for background checks. Um, we were able to uh, create a partnership with Verify Volunteers, which is also used by FIRST. So thank you for putting me in that direction. Um, but that is a way for us to uh, identify the people in our community who have uh, taken that effort to show that they understand how to work with vulnerable populations and that they've been cleared to do so. And now I'm able to organize efforts for real field work, real clinical studies, <coughs> and real efforts with people in schools and hospitals and in the Veterans Administration. Um, we defended intellectual property for the first time in our community in November. Uh, I uh, created digital badges with some blockchain behind them. Blockchain, how many of you are interested in blockchain? I will frame that. The two of us can geek out in the back when you're working on the hands. But basically, it creates an immutable uh, timeline. It also gives you the ability to send money to places that don't have the infrastructure for it, and it allows you to create smart contracts that automatically deploy resources if certain milestones have been verified. So for people in Jordanian refugee camps who are allowed to earn money for the first time, you're creating distance learning to teach them 3D printing. We've partnered them with NGOs in the medical fields, so they're going to be printing not only arms and hands that will be given away for free, but also medical equipment like stethoscopes, 3 printable microscopes, and, and other, other materials. And uh, they'll be paid for that. So we're creating something sustainable, and we're able to validate their training and the level of the quality of their work using blockchain, and to also give them um, support with materials that have been donated and also with other humanitarian aid. Um, we were able to support a number of initiatives in places. Um, one of the ones that I found uh, was Enable Aiden. Um, it showed to me the importance of having a group of people committed to just checking in with each other. Because I found that there were these chapters, these volunteer corps that were putting themselves in harm's way and were not getting the support that they needed. So initially, some of these groups would ask me for filament, or they would ask me if I could send an extruder head or teach them how to, you know, MacGyver or something. And 
Over time, they would ask me for medicine and water and directions to get to food. And so um, they started telling me that their kids were starving. So we, one of the people that we partnered with through the United Nations uh, was called Pure Hands. And so they have been giving me access to free shipping of humanitarian aid to our volunteers and to the people that they're serving. Um, we had our global conference called the NeighborCon in December, um, just outside of Washington, D.C. I knew the quality of the advocacy program for FIRST because I had seen it for myself. Uh, it's one of the best programs I've ever seen in D.C. and I live there, so I've seen a lot of them. Um, the youth spent three days learning and practicing and spoke very eloquently on issues that truly matter to them about funding for STEM, funding for schools, funding for maker spaces in the community. And they were willing to share that experience and create a training for our community, which doesn't have that much experience with it, but is compassionate and uses those resources without really knowing how to advocate for them. So we have learned a lot from you on that front. I wish that the other end, the part of the team that's presenting on that was here to know how valuable that was to our community and to see that training coming from youth with amazing 21st century skills is really important. Um, we've done device testing. We're looking forward to seeing designs come from this community, to seeing testing coming from this community, and um, we're hoping that you'll join us for camp and then present your results, um, both in our uh, conferences, I'll print posters for you, and then in a preprint journal that we're launching for a scientific publication of food citizen science. I'm going to blow through the next slides because you pretty much read everything at this point. So this is one of the chapters that presented at our conference but has been working with us. It was started by uh, aid workers who were named after the Ebola epidemic to address the need for prosthetics. They can't print for themselves all the time, so they definitely need people who may not know the identity of the people they're printing for, but they will need that support. They don't have power all the time, and also they, they needed the extra support with redesign. The filament and the power are precious. They pe need people who don't have 3D printers but do have access to CAD skills just to pre flight it and tell them if the supports are right and will this work. Um, I'm showing you the, the clinic book because uh, one of the things they had to design was signage that would keep them from being um, hustled for bribes. Let's put it that way. They, they had to show what they did using pictures as well as words and then to promote the work. So we'll move on. I'm looking forward to not only making cats with you, but testing the materials and the technology. That's SUNY Polytechnic's uh, living classroom. They identified a printer for the field that would hold in state, hold its memory. The, the design that was being printed even after it lost power. So that when power is restored, it could resume printing where it was. It prints well under humidity and in heat. Um, it's highly portable and it didn't use proprietary materials. Um, but we would, are looking forward to asking other people to print it where they are and to lug it around with them. So if you're looking for a printer for outdoor maker fairs and for travel, um, we should talk because we have room for you as part of the research. And this is what the University of Maryland has been using for testing. They use a luggage scale to see how many pounds a hand can hold before the fingers give. Uh, and then they jerry rig the sledgehammer to test feet. I am absolutely certain we can test in protocols of your own that would be very valuable in seeing if a catastrophic failure um, of the design would cause a catastrophic injury of the feet. Um, and or would be something that would be able to show which materials are best for certain types of use. Um, and then we have here an example of the pre-flighting software identifying with the scan code. Okay, moving forward. Okay, so for leadership and communication, if that if those soft skills are you know, strong in your group or need to be encouraged or just need to stay sharp while you're off season. Hosting workshops is not only a great way for us to provide a Schuster-like inventory for people who are going to be treating surges of patients, um, but it is also a really great way to recruit because you can begin working with very young students. You can be doing myoelectric um, experiments with kids in the sixth grade and up. You can be building robotic, robotic hands that have value to someone who really needs them. And those eighth graders will go into the first Lego leagues. Those Lego leagues are looking for people to teach them 3D printing when they go into the next level. Every single one of the things that we need are skills that you need to nurture and are pre recruiting because they have value and purpose and they really do um, comply with the mission. Um, 
the art that we include in our designs definitely improves the medical outcome because people use it longer. One of the first people we gave a hand to, his arm grew an inch and a half longer because he was using his hand, not only developing muscles and bones for the area that was working the hand, but to actually cause a growth spurt in the limb. We need to keep giving them the next device so that that growth spurt won't stop. So every hand that goes to a person, just realize they'll need the next hand before they need shoes. They'll need the next hand, they'll need several that year. And it's nice if you can give them more than one because parents tend to keep something that valuable nice and withhold it if they think it's going to get broken or dirty. So just imagine that for every child who gets one of these, it would really be ideal to give them more than one. One that we challenge them to break and one that they can use when it's time for their grandparents to come visit. We need your writing skills because it inspires. It captures the history and it bears witness to people that we can't help. It would be incredibly important not to waste that pain. It would be incredibly important to document what you know so that the person that comes after you can pick it up and carry it a little farther. Because all of us are just part of the team that we don't completely get to meet. Look, if you're interested in linguistics and international studies, I desperately need you to start translating so that we can share and that we can capture the stories. Um, this is where I've been working with Pure Hands. I know that that's a, a they work with women and children. A lot of the people that we're teaching 3D printing are people I can't identify for their own safety. Um, but they need people, real people, to be talking to them online to get them through the problems that they have because they can't post publicly. When we're interested in people who, are, um, who are, have um, a passion for public health because that's what this is. There are um, 18, what is it? Um, there's a need for 18,000 prosthetists in Africa alone. I think there's some countries that only have one or two people. Um, there's no way one or two people can make enough prosthetics for a whole country. Um, there are millions of people, 32 million people have upper limb differences and they're not getting anything, no, no form of care. Um, one in 1,500 people um, has an upper limb difference just from amniotic bed syndrome alone. So, the places where these are most prevalent are the places that are the most underserved. So as much as we can, we will try to match you with someone that you get to meet. But please understand also that the person that you might be meeting is the person who is medically trained, who had nothing to offer until that moment, and they truly need that partnership. They need a partnership with you. So um, I'm hoping that um, if you're interested in public health, there, there are many aspects of public health that we ask. Uh, big data and data visualization, I just got an offer from Microsoft to help with that, and I thought no one to match that to. Um, similarly, media arts, there are artists who come to workshops and then created art on our behalf. Uh, one of them, uh, the, uh, there were high school students that created a song called Lend a Hand, and so their form of help is celebrating what we do and including those images and video and sharing the music as a way of uh, contributing to um, what we do. And then I just wanted to share with you that there are thousands and thousands of people who have received these devices. The MPH 3D Print Exchange is, um, tells me that the top five downloaded devices from the NIH um, are enabled designs. So this is Cam. He's one of the people who came to the conference. It turns out when he got his hand, it was the first time they realized he was right handed. And he prefers to learn how to write on chalk on the pavement with a clunky robotic hand instead of the hand that he can feel with. He is learning how to explore the world and it's expanding his opportunity for play. No one knows what he's capable of. He's using that 3D printed hand to push start to print his next device. He's our youngest designer. He's designing out of Sculpey and they bake it and then they scan it and that becomes their starting point for CAD. But he's adapting his handlebars for his bike and the cutlery at home and he's created a universal adapter to hold his toys. So I'm truly, truly begging you to choose to matter to someone. It can be an art project, it can be in something else. But this world is very wide. There are a lot of places for all of you to become engaged in this. And as your interests change, to pivot and find that there is still opportunity for you to become engaged um, and to give back. Um, the designs that I wanted to show you quickly, the, as a way of teaching 3D printing, we show them how to turn the, the, uh, the printer on the pause or to hold things in steady, change the filament and they were able to make that as a design effort. In Cameroon, they're using uh, subtraction uh, to put in messages inside the palm. 
things like uh, you are strong and beautiful or you are strong in love. Um, in Rwanda, they're telling me that they find it there. It's very much like before the genocide. And uh, in, sorry, I can't remember telling you, it was very much like uh, days before the Rwanda genocide. So they're putting in information to help children to relocate um, their parents if someone should disappear as a caregiver because there are a number of adults disappearing in their area. Um, children who have other differences are allowed to go to high school. So they're trying to teach them in the maker spaces how to use this technology and to give them hands and see if they can integrate them back into schools. Uh, the first team um, for, that came for First Global, we gave a 3D printer and it turned out to be the first 3D printer in the nation of Cameroon. Um, they created a maker space, a STEM program for girls, and they partnered with the medical school. So just know that we'll probably never be able to fully appreciate the impact of, of what First uh, Team uh, 15 did. There are other designs here that include elastic cord, which is great in the first world, um, or in the third world, where there's heat and humidity involved in trying to store the energy from the hands. And then there's a, uh, elastic bands from the orthodontists as another way of quickly changing them. The volunteer community is extremely diverse. You have beginner skills, and then you have people who are at the forefront of their field in myoelectric prosthetics. And, uh, and TMI surgery. Um, this is an example of polyjet printing where you can print with 14 different materials to alter the hardness or the color of a print. Um, and I asked it to be transparent so that I could teach aspects of stress and impact of cording um, and mechanics. But I know that as part of the mentoring of the community, you can be partnered and share the stage in October with the subject matter experts for their fields. Um, these are the designs that were released after the conference simply by gathering people online in the same room, we went from having eight hands and three arms to getting five more hands, two more arms, another exoskeleton, and um, and also the leg for the first time because of keeping with the new guidelines for 3D printing and medical designs uh, by the FDA. And I hope that um, you'll take a look at the destructive tests um, from the class that decided to take the leg that was introduced and design their own feet and uh, see what they could, uh, what they could come up with that would be suitable for an eight-year-old who likes to jump out of trees and stomp on things. So, thanks so much. Okay, so we're gonna take a step back now from what Maria was saying and go back to when she was talking about EnableCon. So Jordan and I were able to go to EnableCon and there we gave two presentations, one on the new perspective and conscious-based learning and another one on our advocacy efforts. Um, because of that, we were able to go and visit Capitol Hill and we met with the co-chair of the Congressional Maker Caucus uh, to talk with him about Enable and about the efforts and uh, like things in STEM that we feel are important. And then um, at EnableCon, we're also able to meet so many different people from all over the world and learn a lot more. We were able to start the Youth Advocacy Board for Enable, um, which we're still working in uh, getting that developed and started. Um, um, a quick fun fact. Sorry, I, don't, I hope the local news here comes out with that. Um, Yuri Becklin, the gentleman we met with, his office has, uh, he's actually a chief of staff, a deputy chief of staff for Mark McConnell, who is a representative of California. Um, that aside, his office has the only 3D printer on Capitol Hill, and they'll actually teach classes and print things on it. Um, they'll have summer interns, uh, and they'll, they'll print them some Capitol Hill themed object uh, as a parting gift when they go back to school or go back to wherever they're from. So, uh, I just, he told us about that, and that was, that was a cool thing, so I just want to add that. Right, turn it on. Uh, so now we're going to get a part of the presentation where we learn, where we tell you guys how you, your teams and your members can get involved with Enable. Uh, so there's like five certain, almost like really good, great ways to get involved in this. That is to print hands and create open source materials for Enable, to educate and spread the message of Enable. Uh, Working, making partnerships, networking, and even creating a chapter, uh, distributing the hands they printed, and finding one need for hands, and uh, overcoming design challenges that are presented to us. So, yeah. we'll go a little deeper into each of those. Um, just so, because we're going to be using technical terms, 
uh, and so just so you all understand that, um, in case we need to clarify, this is basically the uh, generic skeleton of my hand. Uh, the designs do vary um, from design to design, but f for the most part, they're the same. So you have at the very first part of the finger, we call that the fingertip, obviously. Um, the middle part between the palm and the finger, we call it, refer to that as the proximal. Uh, not until you have the palm, uh, you have five proximals with five fingertips, four of which are the fingers, and then there's one that's the thumb. Um, and then the back part of the hand is called the gauntlet. And that's actually what attaches to the person's forearm. So that's what provide, uh, helps provide resistance so they can actually close the hand. Um, and on that are, is something called the tensioner with a series of tension pins. And each of those tension pins has a, a string that goes from the pin all the way to the front of the finger, finger tip. Um, and then essentially what that allows you to do is uh, as you bend your hand like this, the fingers close. So it's kind of, it kind of works like that, that motion. Um, and then obviously that's all held with this with a retention clip, uh, Velcro, and then for the palm to hold your, to hold um, what's left of the person's limb. Uh, there's different different things. Some people use Velcro. Uh, some people print uh, a demo bar, which is like kind of like a little strip of plastic that you can screw onto the palm. Um, there's a whole. Some people use leather even. There's a whole bunch of different ways. So that's that's you customize to uh, your climate, your comfort levels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are many different ways to get involved in handle, but now we're going to go part if you want, if you have a 3D printer, if you want to get a 3D printer, how you can print hands. Uh, so first thing you're going to need to do to print hands is get a printer. Um, right now on the screen is a list of what the printers that we use in our little uh, 3D printer that we have at our school. Uh, we'll get into more detail about those printers later. But once you get a printer, you should learn how to 3D print. Uh, there are many video guides online or just uh, handbooks normally made by the printer company, normally made by the printer companies, so that uh, you can learn how to 3D print using the printer. Uh, there's also software normally that goes along with the 3D printer, so you should get a good grip on that, pun intended. Um, uh, and if you want to just get started in hands, uh, use the given designs that we already have developed, so the Phoenix hands and the Raptor Re Reloaded are the hands that we print at our school, and you can find the files for those and instructions on how to assemble the hands once you print them on the anywhereintheficial.org website. So uh, yeah, and once you print the hands, you should just assemble them and then ship them off. Uh, just a note about the software real quick. Basically just what that does is it takes a universal file and translate it, translates it into a proprietary file that your specific printer reads. So like each of those printers has a different file that it reads, um, but it's basically a translator. And once you know one, you really know them all. They don't vary all too much. So if you figured out one, you know, you see them all. Um, so there's also different types of printers. You have FDM, uh, and each, each one has a, a three-letter abbreviation. You have fused deposition modeling, stereo lithography, digital light processing, selective laser sintering, selective laser melting, electronic beam melting, or sorry, excuse me, that's supposed to be electronic beam melting. Um, I, I thought I fixed that. Uh, and you also have laminated object manufacturing. Nine times out of ten, you're going to encounter uh, a person, or you will get a FDM printer. Um, you can print the other ones, but usually those are like experimental style printers, and also really, really, really expensive. So we're going to ignore all those, and we'll just focus on fused deposition modeling. Uh, and the way that works is um, you can use two main materials. You can use metal powder, uh, which is highly flammable, so be careful if you do. Uh, you can also use plastic. Uh, FDM is the most common style of printer. Those are the two most common materials used with it. Um, it's pretty cost effective. It's an economic printer. Um, you can get them for a couple hundred bucks at the cheapest, and of course you can go all the way up and well into the thousands if you want to. Um, and uh, there, there are other materials you can use, but those require special extrusion heads, and it gets pretty, pretty good stuff. Um, but basically how it works is you start out with a, a thread, basically. It's just a, a, a thread of plastic. Uh, and the, that material gets heated uh, and pushed through an extrusion tip. And that extrusion tip, um, imagine like a really, 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 really tiny frosting uh, pipe, piping bag, if you if you're going to be bake. Uh, basically, that's the way it works. It gets pushed through that, and that uh, extrusion tip is on a three-axis um, swivel, quote unquote. It can move X, Y, and Z. 
um, and so you get the 3D model. Uh, and then it lays down material layer by layer, and uh, we refer to that as resolution. So the higher resolution, the thinner those lines are, and the more detailed your print can be. And then after um, after prints, it gets cooled, um, not by any special means. It's usually just going to let it sit for a few minutes. Uh, and then that plus hardens and solidifies together, and then you can just pick it up, and you have what you printed. So now we're going to go back into detail a little bit more about 3D printers themselves. Uh, we're going to get a little, uh, a little into. Uh, <laughs> um, we're going to go into the 3D printers that we use. So, yeah. The four 3D printers that we use are the Uprint SC Plus, the Wallspot Tad 6, the Monoprints Maker Select Plus, and the EcoCycle, or EcoCycle if you're pronouncing it both ways. You got it. Uh, it, it, we have like a very, we're very fortunate for the printers that we have. So we have a pretty large price range, which is pretty good for educating people on 3D printing. Uh, so starting at the top, the Uprint SE Plus is quite expensive, and uh, but because it's expensive, the build quality is quite like very good. It rarely makes mistakes. Um, the going down the walls about Tat Six, the Mono Price Maker Select Plus. Those are sort of the mid range price, mid price range. Uh, the Quality for the printing is medium because you pay the price for it. And then the eco cycle is the cheapest one that we have, which has like, let me, it gets the job done. Yeah, yeah it gets the job done. There's um, some margin of error, but that's okay. Yeah. And you, it, it, some things are out of your control. But, uh, and the materials that we normally use are PLA and ABS. Uh, P, the benefits of P, PLA is that it handles stress very well, and then ABS is more rigid and stiff. Um, and then some things, some printers use proprietary cartridges, so they'll almost always use ABS or PLA, that's what we sort of run into. But a lot of printer companies will have cartridges that you need to buy for their printers, and that can sort of become expensive. And then we also have support material, which is also proprietary uh, for the printer that you have, and it also produces more select, precise prints. Not, not every printer requires support material, um, that, that's based on your printer. Um, and just as a note, uh, the, a couple of these were actually the one the tech department at our school. We don't have the funds for all of these. We just have a tech department who's really, really, really nice to us. Uh, so shout out to those guys. Uh, and some accessories that you would want when you start printing hands is build plates, which are some printers you need them, like the Uprint SC Plus needs build plates, or some of them just have the build plate built in. Uh, you would need cleaning tools like pliers, wire cutters, like paint scrapers for getting the uh, things they printed off of the build plate. Uh, some general parts that you need for constructing hands are foam and Velcro for user compliance. So we went before the Velcro is used to keep the, uh, the gauntlet on the person's wrist. And the Velcro is, uh, no, the foam is used so that the, uh, it's more comfortable so their wrist isn't cutting across hard plastic. And then the uh, fingertips are used for grips so they can grab bottles and bike handles and all that stuff. Uh, it's very efficient line, it's used for tensioning and so issues. So. so, when you 3D print, not everything is always roses and rainbows. Uh, a lot of times you're going to have things go wrong, which is okay. That's how everybody learns. It's, it's, you're not the first. Uh, so, a lot of times, one time I, I ran a job and I left school and I came back the next morning and I came to the picture on the left. I made plastic skin. Obviously, yes, you consider it a waste of material, but you also figure out what you did wrong. Uh, a lot of times, it's maybe it ran out of material. Sometimes that happens, and then uh, you, it, it looks like it's printing, but there's just nothing coming out. So you end up with like half of your part. Uh, other times, the alignment's off. Um, the, one on the, the one on the far right, you can see that was actually slanted, so it looks like um, some invisible force pushed the whole thing to the right, or my right, your left. Um, and it's, you know, and then we also ended up with the spaghetti scenario again. That's okay, that's fine. Um, these, these are actually, uh, uh, you know, every printer's gonna have its own thing. These aren't, you know, million dollar pieces of equipment that have hard hardware. Oh, and a quick tidbit, the uh, picture on the left like, just happened last week. So these sort of mistakes happen to like, People have been praying for years, so. Um, Those hands are really used for this conference. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're spaghetti. Um, so, oh. 
oh, we brought the spaghetti. That's what it looks like here in life in case you're curious. Um, I actually show you, do you want to pass that around? You know, I, just, I wouldn't recommend taking it out of the bag. Uh, it crumbles a lot, and then it's a mess. And it's just a lot to clean up. Also, so, don't eat it. It's not really spaghetti. Yes, please don't eat it. We'll have to get the the people. Um, so what a lot of, what some things, and we really do develop this, George does, um, is we have these, these files, these cards you can print. And, um, and basically what those do are, it's the exact same thing, uh, and it's a series of different features. You have spheres, you have um, platforms, you have angles, you have uh, points, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what they do is you can, if you put each one on a separate printer, you can kind of compare the standards of printers. So uh, a lot of times you know, people say, oh, look at this printer, it has um, you know, this statistic and this statistic and this statistic. Yes, that's great, and all numbers are great, I love numbers, but to a lot of people, and including myself, it's not very effective. So if you can show someone, uh, like, if you can show someone the one on the left came from this printer, the one on the right came from that printer, it's going to give you a pretty good idea of which printer is actually better at printing. Um, otherwise, you have to spend a whole lot of time looking at spreadsheets and graphs and, and handbooks, and it gets really boring. Um, it's also a way to check, to make sure you calibrate your printer right. Um, if you guys remember the one that was pushed all the way to the left? Um, that's, that's how we found you know, our calibration was off. Uh, we found the bed wasn't level one time this way because it ended up the print ended up um, mis misformed. Uh, and then you know, then you can really just play with it. They're, they're not different things. Question? Okay. Um, so uh, one of the another great way to get involved in the enable is to educate uh, everyone in your area or your team or anything and spread the message on the So like I said before you can educate your team, uh, talk to other teams and try to get them involved in enable, which is what we're working on right now, actually. Um, and you can bring enable handouts, pun intended also, and uh, hands themselves to demos and community service events to show the community of what you're doing, and hopefully get them involved. And then you can also hold conferences, slash workshops, and get everything, get like, also people in your local area talking about enable. So, uh, one of the things you can also do is if you realize this is something you want to carry on, you can start a chapter. Um, it's actually really easy to do. Um, there's a lot of people who can contact for help, colleges, universities, nonprofits, businesses, etc. Um, a lot of people who are going to be um, contact other first teams. There's a lot of people who uh, are in first that work on this and they just don't know each other. So putting it on Facebook, sending emails to people is great. Um, you can even reach out to Frog Course and us. You know, we'd be more than happy to help you. Um, also, finding a sponsor for your printing reference is, is a good idea. Um, because one spool of material doesn't cost all that much, but one spool of material only gets you a couple hands. So as you print more and more hands, um, unless your team is very, very fortunate and has a lot of money, which I'm jealous, um, uh, finding a sponsor is usually a good idea or finding someone to uh, raise funds for your hands. Um, and when you actually want to go and officially start your chapter, it's a pretty simple process. You go to www.enablingthefuture.org. Uh, there's at the top, there's a menu bar. You want to click on Get Involved. It go, uh, a drop down menu appears. You want to go to en Enable Community Chapters and then the Enable Chapters Intake Form. It's a Google form. It'll ask you just kind of for contact person, contact information, um, you know, where you're from, so they can kind of they can put you on that map. Um, and they'll even ask, like, what, what are you a part of? Are you, are, are you part of a youth group? Are you part of a 4H group? Are you part of um, a school? or uh, Business, you know, or um, what? Yeah, there's actually an option for first revives. Uh, and then you submit that. Eventually, you get a follow up email with some instructions on what you need to do. Uh, you just follow those instructions. It's really simple. The form takes, I think, three minutes tops. Uh, and then those instructions, then you get that follow up email. If they take it more than an hour, that's, that's excessive. So it's really, really, really easy and really, really fast to be able to do this. Um, if you are going to start a chapter, um, you should also create a Facebook page for your chapter so that you can communicate with other Enable chapters. Um, and actually, so Flogforce, they, they have started their own chapter just like we did. So I'm going to throw it to them and they'll tell you us about all their methods. Frogforce, um, we created our chapter in the summer, 
And um, first base seven, making your chapter a reality other than filling out the form is finding your centralized location. So the library was very wonderful over the summer, and they jumped on our project right away. That was a fun for us. But um, we worked with the library, and we tried to find what goals we wanted for our chapter. And so I'm going to back up a little bit just to start from our beginnings. We uh, were printing hands. We were putting a couple of hands a year, and then we had like 75 total for a bit. When I came on as a freshman, um, I kind of got thrown into it. I kind of walked into the wrong meeting, but I happened to be at the right place at the right time. So that was really cool. And um, last year, we went to World Championships, and we met with Jeff. And we were really inspired. We wanted to be a chapter. We wanted to start something. We didn't realize how big Enable was until we got to World Championships. So then we were trying to figure out what ways we could be a help to Enable. And they told us that there are a lot of Raptors out there, so ARMS would be a good place to start. So we went to the library, and we had a couple of printers in our district at the time. We got a lot more donated through um, sponsorships with Dremel. So through that, we've been printing ARMS, but one thing that we wanted to do is connect to our community. We wanted to get the whole community on the project. So through the library, we contacted every single elementary school, and we want these. Well, we wanted fourth graders to build these because a lot of kids that need the arms and hands are very young, and we felt that connection between the kids in our district and kids who are getting the arms and hands it would be it would just be a better connection because the kids can start at a young age realizing how big of a difference that they're opportunity and that the resources can give to other people. So we also do, um, we're starting a lot with custom prosthetics too. So one thing that Enable helped us with is getting connections with people who need custom made prosthetics. We sent out our first custom and as a chapter um, last Sunday, which is really exciting. His name is Travis, he had amniotic band syndrome. And um, we sent that out. So maybe this is Andrew to talk about how we actually sized him up. Uh, to size the hands, you need to measure a few places, like the wrist, or the, uh, if they don't have a wrist, like, uh, you can measure their bicep or their uh, forearm area, and once you get that, you can find the diameter, and you can size them, because most of the uh, designs are scaled and sized pretty well, so you can just scale them up into the right uh, size, and, uh, but that's pretty much how you uh, size money. So yeah, that, that seems like the easier part, but when they're so far away, you got to get in good contact with the person you're working with. The chapter starts, that like, initiates that connection, but it's up to you to keep the connection going. Like Maria explained earlier, you want to make sure that like they're going to grow up and they're going to need new prosthetics, something might break for the kids to be class. So. That happens as well, but I'm the best one part of it. He's working along the community side of it. Nothing is really possible without your community, and um, the community of Nova has been really coming together to make this a reality. We have our goal of making 200 arms by the end of the summer. We're getting really close. How many do we have exactly? Uh, we got past it? Okay, apparently we got past it. We are at 220 arms, we're going to be shipping them to be able at the end of these weeks. So when keeping in contact with whatever it is you're trying to do, so first, like, either you will initiate the contact or some of them will try to um, tell, talk to you about it. So take for Travis's instance. Um, his mom was really, like, found out about us, and she contacted us and said, okay, this is the thing, can you do this for us? Now, the goal is that you want to make sure that you can um, keep that connection alive. So. Um, what Kirsten did was for Travis, she made, like, she, uh, every day she would email the mom about, like, you know, what's going on, what are they doing. And one day we actually got to Skype Travis and talk to him, which was a really cool experience. Um, it's, it's, a, it's probably one of the best moments of my entire, like, enable and robotics moments ever. And I hope you guys get that too, when you do your own stuff. And I, I got to, um, like, run and, like, coordinate like with one of those schools that we were going to be doing an enable event at. 
And once again, like I, every day I made sure that like, you know, we would like try to talk about like, when are we gonna meet up in person, when are we gonna do this. So having a, um, a proper connection with whoever it is your contact is is a really important and you can make some amazing moments and memories with them. As Carthy was mentioning, we are making a prosthetic for Travis, but there are a lot of backstories to every single person as an individual. We wanted to connect with Travis in a way that he felt like he was a part from, so he was a fellow from us. We actually learned from his mom that he was bullied because of his disability, and we want to make sure that this was the coolest thing that they've ever seen. But we also want to spread enable to his school district as well. So we found out that spreading able to our elementary school was going to have a lot of impact on the kids there, and they're learning how to print too. So we used Dremel uh, 3D40s and 3D45s, and they have a pretty easy interface so that kids at a young age can use them right away. So the kids that are building the prosthetics also are printing them as well in their school library or in their classroom. So that's really cool that they get started right from the get-go with the introductory steps of building the prosthetic. Um, yeah, is there anything else you want to talk about? Not really, just we get really fun experiences. Um, when I went to the village, I was saying, well, many of the kids were really excited about it. They were like, oh, I can't wait for like, you know, when you come back next, like, you know, next year this with the other kids. And many kids were almost like kind of sad that we were going, when we were, we were done with the entire event. So I just hope you guys get that same feeling. Yeah, and they can start really young too. So imagine you're in fourth grade, you're already building prosthetics. Imagine what awesome stuff you'd be building by the time you get high school. Um, I forgot actually. Frog Force started, I started a bionics group on our team. We're trying to come up with a newer um, prosthetic that is my electronic so that we can make it so that each hair can move individually and so that it's more efficient and we can build a stronger one that we wanted to give to you. Well, so you start off building the prosthetics and you can make your own at some point, which is awesome. It's a bionic arm. And, yeah. So, you know, I'm really amazed at kind of like work with these high school students this last year, and it's very impressive what they're doing. I mean, our chapter is led out of the students, um, you know, standing right here, working with the community, working with the library. We actually have the, the director of our library here. Um, Jerry Farkas, and then um, one of the leaders of all of our school districts, uh, Lynette here. So it's what these kids are doing. They're they're not only working, you know, as a robotics team. They're working with our community, with a with the director of the library, with the school districts, going into the different, um, you know, elementary schools. We've hit three out of the five. We've got two more remaining. So, um, so. You know, it's it's exciting for me as an adult mentor, kind of working with them and seeing the, the talent. Um, you know, each each one of the students has different skill sets. Like Andrew is a pro with Autodesk with the animations, and um, Carver takes up program manager, does a lot of work, um, you know, organizing events. Um, so it's and, and our leader uh, Kirsten does a great job leading the team. So it's. Um, and we've got a number of other team members that do a great job helping us, but it's exciting working with this um, great group of high school students. Um, it'll be interesting to see where they, uh, when they become careers, get through college, and where they end up you know, 10 years from now. You'll see great things out of these uh, students. So, thank you. So when you also have these hands, or or you aren't putting the hands yourselves, but people, well, a great way to get started in Enable is to contact your local, is to find local need for hands. Uh, by doing, doing this, for that, you can contact local agencies. Sorry, I'm tripping up on the words. Um, you can contact schools, community centers, homeless shelters, veteran centers, and not-for-profit organizations who, to, just to find people that really need the hands that you're making. Okay, can you hear me? Um, so for the last four years, Enable has been focused on hands. Um, they're starting to work on um, feet in some of our other countries. But um, about a year and a half ago, I realized that we had this collective hive of amazing 
um, minds that could come up with other things that would be able to help people. So I started posing design challenge questions um, to get you guys thinking outside of the box. And um, this first one that I did, uh, I was um, thinking about how we're making these hands for people who have no fingers and no wrists. But what about all of the people who have their fingers still, who have had strokes, um, or who have uh, neuro neurological disorders where their hands won't open? Um, and I'm guessing that a lot of you in, in here have, know at least one person in your life or have met somebody who's had a stroke, um, where it's near impossible for them to even hold their toothbrush or tie their shoes or, or even a, a credit card. Um, so I, I want people to start thinking about how you can design things to help people um, with all sorts of different um, disabilities, or I call them different abilities, um, because you have this amazing mind. And for this challenge, I asked them to make these make tools for people who couldn't use their fingers anymore. And, and the the design challenge came up with over 200 designs. Most of them came from the under 18 category. Um, the, there's a, a, a device that will help people open up a yogurt cup. That might not seem like a big feat for a lot of you because your fingers work, but when you can't grasp something as simple as a yogurt lid, it makes, that's 15 cents worth of plastic. And now my grandpa can eat his own yogurt without having to ask grandma for help. Um, there's a lot of things that you could do. Just kind of walk around and use your hands and think, well, what, how would I do this if I had one hand? And, or no functions in my fingers. And you could be designing things for um, people in your local retirement centers. Um, another challenge I posed was um, I worked with a 3D printing company called Matter Hackers, and we came up with another design challenge to come up with tactile learning solutions and tools for the visually impaired. Um, because you can use 3D printing to make all sorts of things. Um, now there's a uh, design for little tabs that you can put on a Rubik's Cube. How do you play Rubik's Cube when you're blind? You don't. But now you can because there's Braille tabs that tell them they've got the whole green side working. Um, and the, the kids at the junior blind school that we took these to, they were over the moon. They never, never had anything like that. Um, there's a whole bunch of, um, again, these were, these designs here are for the, the visually impaired challenge that we had, and they came from the under 18 category. Um, tactile maps with Braille, um, uh, little tabs they go on the piano so that kids can learn the, the kinds of notes. Um, all sorts of things that you could be creating that don't have to do with hands or prosthetics, um, but that will help a lot of people. Um, we've had a couple of uh, feathered friends get some prosthetic legs from some of our chapters. The, these were made from um, our Enable Germany chapter. Um, and both of those birds would have had to be put down, but they, um, they are running around like happy little birds. Um, Enable France just fit an octopus um, because the front leg that he needed um, to eat with um, was was harmed and had to be amputated, and so now there's <laughs> a few printed octopus leg um, from our community. Um, we also have need for places um, like Cameroon and, and especially in 
Africa um, countries where they can't import the, the medical devices that they need for a, a reasonable enough cost, and the need is obviously there. Um, we, we can 3D print stethoscopes and um, umbilical cord clips that save people's lives and cost pennies on the dollar to make. Um, you guys can, can come up with designs to help um, people far away that you'll never meet. Um, there's also uh, musical instruments. We have a lot of um, underserved schools here in the United States, but also in other countries where um, they have no music programs, they have no art programs. Um, if you want to come up with a crazy looking flute and um, print them out, put them in a box. I've got a charity who would love to send care packages to their orphanages in Uganda where the students have, you know, they don't, they don't have whiteboards, they have chalkboards and they have to take turns with chalk and they have dirt floors and the last thing that they have or could ever imagine having is a flute for each child to play with. Um, I really encourage you to reach out to your communities. Um, we have a lot of retirement centers around the world. We've got a couple of um, schools who are going into their communities, much like Frog Force is going into the schools. But if you go into your retirement centers, um, you're going to come up and meet people who've had strokes or who are, are, have arthritis so bad that they can't pick up bingo chips or um, anything like that. And you're also going to meet a lot of um, retired engineers and carpenters and plumbers who are stuck in these homes who have not had anything to engage their minds besides crossword puzzles and Sudoku um, to keep them busy. And just maybe you're not making them a hand, but you going in there and teaching them Tinkercad or showing them how a 3D printer works and then helping them go through their center and find things that, that could be 3D printed that would help all of them, a spoon holder, um, anything. Um, you are going to make just as big of an impact, maybe bigger, than if you were to make a, a 3D printed prosthetic hand for one person. Um, I would really like to thank all of you for um, just everything you do to encourage um, STEM in schools and um, our, our future relies on you guys, um, the people like you who are going to use technology to make a difference. Um, and I, I just, you rock, that's all. So, should you get involved in any of There's always that, that one question in your mind that's always in everyone's mind when I'm ready to propose. What's in it for me? So, unless you need a hand, I mean, that, you know, we know a guy, you can probably, probably help out with that. Um, but there's also benefits to students on our team in several different ways. Uh, you you formed your team relations of uh, the custom frog force, and before we started on this project, project, they were just another team that crowd. We didn't really know each other. Now we can collaborate. A lot of times uh, it leads to students developing uh, leadership skills, like Kirsten. She's she's led this for a couple of years on her team. Communication skills are always great. That way everybody's you know, speaking the same language. It's a great way to learn how to convey ideas because when you have something in your head and you need to explain to the rest of the community, um, Developing your communication skills is something that you can take anywhere, to any job, any college, wherever you go. Um, a lot of times you learn technical skills, like you'll learn how to use a 3D printer. I didn't know that before I started. Um, you'll learn how to use time management, time, you'll learn how to manage your time well, excuse me, um, which is a, a great thing to have because you, know, you gotta plot, you gotta plan, all right, well, you know, I have this, this item to print, but it's gonna take this long, will I make the deadline? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Or, oh, you know, we had to act as time management for this conference to make sure we were all on the time. Um, 
And my favorite, real life technical experience. Personally, I love making things, so this is right up my alley. Uh, and actually, yeah, um, what this, what something else you can pull from this is uh, you can form your own engineering experiences for this. So by show of hands, how many of you guys have heard of like PLTW, Project Lead Way? No? Yeah? All right, cool. So we have that at our school. I'm sure some of you have to have it at your school. Um, and we have a senior capstone class called Engineering Design Development, or EDD for short. And in that class, uh, we're in groups and we get to choose a project. Uh, or excuse me, we choose a problem we have to solve. We justify that problem, we go through the engineering process, and it takes an entire year to work on one project. So uh, this year, my group and I, we decided to uh, modify a hand. We wanted to take a finger and develop it to uh, develop it to make it more adaptable. It's ready. So we went through a couple of prototypes. With you, or initially one that was you know a little small and then poorly made, and then as you go through that iterative process, you end up with uh, another one. And actually, there's an I can't really show you because I have both my hands full. Um, but there's a a insert that goes in that hole, and that actually holds an equal from a pen that you get at Staples, which I don't know if you guys have that in the show, Staples, Office of Black Pen. So the way that works then is it holds that pen, and then you know the person can just bend their wrist. These fingers are going while this one extends because uh, we reverse the tension on them, and they can write. And it's, uh, if because it's kind of hard to hold something as small and thin as a pen uh, with a prosthetic hand, but you know, you're able to go, and this goes back to the whole open source design, build, and modify concept of, uh, you can change it, you can make it suit your needs. If you have an idea and you want to build off of something that already exists, you can do that. Uh, and you, you don't even have to be a part of class. If you want to do this on your own, you can do it too. It's a great way to um, tailor an engineering experience to your, uh, your speed, your level of knowledge, your expertise, what you like to do. Um, and you get to, you get to build the law skills that way. So we're looking into what we can do now um, that we've kind of learned, captured the learning process and we want to get more involved with the table. So one of the more immediate things that we're looking into is getting our community to come together for a workshop to teach them, kind of similar to what we might be doing in a few minutes, um, how to put together a hand and getting more people interested. Uh, we're also looking at creating um, tutorial vid videos. There are some tutorial videos out there. However, it's just one big long video. So we're looking into cutting the process into separate videos so that if you just want to learn how to put a finger on the palm, you, there's one video for that. Um, Um, one of the other things that we, uh, we've been talking about with Jen Ray is planning a hackathon. Do you guys know what that is? Kind of just, yeah, all right, cool. Uh, so basically, we would, it's basically one of Jen's design challenges, but with a time constraint. And uh, you end up with a prototype, it's obviously not a fish product. Um, but that kind of, that's the uh, rapid prototype concept or active brainstorming. Um, one of the other things we want to do is collaborate with. Uh, SUNY IT more, which is at, at the classroom. Uh, excuse me, sorry, I'm losing my train uh, Yeah, with the um, living classroom, we're in New York and they're in New York, so it's very close. So we've been working with them to figure out um, how we can start uh, becoming a testing facility, maybe, and also uh, how we can help their classroom when it comes to shipping hands and communicating. Um, we're also hoping to help out again at NimCon 2018, uh, give some presentations and uh, help meet more people and maybe advocate more. Um, and if any of you are interested in that too, that would be awesome to have more teams come. And then we're also talking about a science journal type thing and podcasts, which you know more about that than I do if you want to talk. 
So I use the opportunities when they come to DC for the advocacy conference for first and for the um, camp and for the conference. But if you find that you're also in the DC area, I can, um, uh, I'd like to host you uh, for, for a day. Um, I take them to the FDA and uh, they were able to do video postcards so we could include more people remotely and use that communication. But also the National Press Club has been hosting classes in podcasting and communication. So uh, we'll be able to be part of the a student organization for that. Um, the uh, people who are working with me on geolocation and distribution and inventory management, I know this sounds incredibly dry. So in the balance of the universe, I am taking uh, the people who work on the geodesy projects to the NASA geodesy project with me, where we shoot lasers out of the telescopes on either side of the cornfields and target reflector sites on the satellites that support the GPS networks and also geolocation networks for other systems, everyone but Russia, uh, France, and so on. Um, and then uh, we, uh, when we get tired of that, we're going to go shoot the moon, literally the reflector sites on the Apollo um, landing sites. So we have an amazing amount of fun. I, I really want to get people who are engaged in our work to see that first and its ethics and your technical skills and your leadership skills and all of those reference century skills will take you anywhere, literally anywhere that you want to go. So I try to include that training and we focus on these, but I'm hoping to um, enjoy as a community during the downtime and our cosplay um, parties and our field trips, all the places that this will take you. Uh, so then this is one of the quotes that all of us from the we kind of we value, we appreciate, uh, really speaks to us. It's from Margaret Mead, um, and she said, never doubt the small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And that, that quote in and of itself kind of embodies what it is, because it started out as a garage project, and now it's a global project in 76 and counting countries with thousands of volunteers who speak different languages, uh, have totally different walks of life, uh, different resources available to them, and we're all working towards what, it's the same thing. We're all, we're all together to get to that goal, and that's really important. So, well, welcome. Well, I um, so, if you want to contact us, uh, one great way to contact us is using the 1511 Enable Chat for Facebook page. Uh, it's a long link. You can take a picture of me, probably don't want to write that down. And uh, you can also just go to the Enable website, which is where a lot of resources for Enables are. And uh, you can look at the, you can email us at 1511 Enable at robotics.com. All that stuff is on the back of the uh, cards that you got with the button on it, so, yeah. And, uh, um, and last but not least, we want to thank all of you guys for joining us. We want to thank Jen for coming all the way from Washington, Maria coming all the way from Maryland, and Fog Forest. You guys are awesome. Thanks for being here and joining us. It's because everything's out of the common stream. It's not transdermal. It is it's out outside the skin. And because everyone's a collaborative researcher, everything that you've done has embodied that, and you've documented it, and you've shared it. So I want you to receive the first part of the case of green that's going to be on your way to you. Uh, when we badge you up with Jen's badges, you're going to be our first experiment in using blockchain and the smart contracts to give you the rest of that. But totally cutting edge. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for being, being here today. We know we talked for a very long time. If any of you have matches or chairs presentations or other obligations or other conferences to attend uh, and you need to go, we, we won't hold you hostage. I won't take it personally. Uh, so if, if you'd like to stay with us, I, 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 I really was about to say that. Um, so if you'd like to stay with us, we will uh, start the, 
I say I hate to say hands on activities because I don't mean it, but like, you know. Um, yeah. So, uh, like I said, if you want to learn how to put fingers and palms together and uh, tension those fingers, uh, stay on this side of the room. If you want to learn um, more about the tensioning and fixing hands that already exist, um, I recommend you go to that side of the room. Um, so we can, I think we can, yeah, does that sound good? Unless anyone has questions. Um, it, yes, it depends. Uh, sometimes we can do, uh, we usually shoot for the higher end of a fill. We don't always do 100%. Um, and a couple of the softwares don't use percentages. They call it high density or low density, and it's a spectrum. Um, so there's really not a number associated with it. Um, but usually, as long as you're upwards of 75% or the equivalent of that, probably. So, uh, well, so uh, these forms of hands are sort of like, hang on, something to add about that, the infill. But um, it depends what you're doing, really. So one of, it's actually really funny for us, but we were, with the arms, you have to, you print them flat, and then we put them in a really hot water and roll them to size. Well, at first, we asked them, so we made this day go, we tried using, I think it was like 40% infill or something. But when we put it in the hot water, it boiled. And our prosthetic literally bubbled. It was actually really cool looking, but also, oh, yeah, we had it. It like poofed up and bubbled and literally we cooked it. So, yeah, we, then we printed a better version that's way thicker. It's almost like 100%. It really depends what you're printing. So, uh, thanks for the clarification, Frog Force. <laughs> Or the story, I guess. Um, more of the, about how the hands work. Uh, these form of hands and the motion of the hands that are up here infer that the user actually has a part of their wrist. So then their wrist goes around the gauntlet and it's tied in by, this, by the foam and the buckle. And then when they twist there, it should put pressure on it. So for forwards, the tensioning, uh, the fishing line tensioning and the elastic tensioning closes the fingers. So when they move their wrist, the hand closes. So if, when you grab like a bottle of water, they can just twist their wrist and the fingers close around the bottle of water and they can drink it. Um, actually, we have a, sorry, uh, we have a couple of hands up here that you can actually try even if you do have your fingers. So uh, when, we, when we start working, if you want to come and try one, you're more than welcome to. Uh, that was right one too, you guys can all try to do one too. Um, for the arms, they're a little different. They're the exact same idea except that say you don't have a wrist. That say you still have your elbow joint. It works the same way. But you bend at the wrist and then it closes the fingers. It's just the same idea if you want to do the arms. How long would it take to make a medical arm? So I can, uh, do you guys want to take arms and all take hands? So that's good. All right, cool. Uh, so I only know about hands because that's all, all we do. It depends on the size uh, because there's a base file and then you can scale that file up and down. So a standard, um, one hundred one to one scale takes around eight to ten hours, given your take printer. Um, and then I've I've seen some jobs where uh, if you have um, large sets, it's like one and a half scale to one. Uh, that actually has to be done on two different jobs because it just won't all fit on build plate. So that takes upwards of a day. Uh, but actual printing time, you're looking at fifteen hours, sixteen hours, roughly. And then something is up five minutes. The hand that holds the water, the hand that's holding the water bottle is uh, two cable ties and an elastic band, and only two pieces of printing. They literally can assemble that in less than two minutes right off the printer. Um, the flexi hand is using uh, hinges of uh, a filament called NinjaFlex, and that takes about 15 to put together. Um, the Cub Scouts, um, who are earning the robotics collective by building these, they can build three of these in an hour. Once they build the first one, it's kind of like a Lego kit. It's just the ultimate Lego kit. Um, this was designed
mind to print on an extremely small bed. It's an entire hand, and the fingers are all pre-jointed. So you just snap them open like printing chain. But because of the orientation, it's a little bit more delicate. So this one's a little longer. Um, there's a really wonderful um, assembled one that's with fragile. About arms specifically, they take longer to print because there's more material. Depends the arm as well. We printed one and it took like 12 hours, and then we have to print a really large one for a 17 year old on a robotic team called the Pharaohs, and it took like 36 to print all this stuff or more. 64 hours. 64 hours in total. So it took like 36 for just one part alone because it's so big. But, and then we're making, yeah. We can, that's just the palm part in comparison to one for a little kid. There's also people, like adult size, who need them too. So they're a lot bigger to go a lot longer. And for building, it takes fourth graders about two one-hour sessions to build them in their entirety. Oh, yeah. How do you fund this in terms of materials and cost? How, how do you, do you internally fund this or fundraise? Uh, so at the beginning, we were partnered with the library, and there was a like sponsorship that was donated to the library by one of the, yeah. We actually had a launch with the students, and we did a marketing day where we invited businesses and people from the community just to talk about the program and offer if they wanted to donate. We have a form on our website for the library, and the student service as well is how people can get involved. But we were lucky enough with the library, sorry, to have um, a patron um, in Memorial that donated some money. She was a teacher, and this was, this was definitely right up her alley when it came to projects. So we started it that way, but then we had our local rotary uh, we've had uh, local businesses that, because of engineering and that fit, uh, they've also made donations. And then we've invited people to take a tour and see what the students have been doing. And then we've had individuals. It takes, uh, costs about $30 for maybe some filament. So we, when we put our sponsorship form together, we said uh, one box of filament would equal about $30. Someone's made a donation of $30, and as those rack up. The library's been keeping those um, keeping track for the students, the donations that come in and then work with them to get their film in and, and then make the job for the 200 hands that was the goal for them. We get a lot of community support, so should you do some kind of marketing and show, show it out there. So. Um, this, this has been in curriculum, if you call it experiential learning or service-based learning, it's actually part of the curriculum materials. Um, and then there are other places that are willing to print for you, Barnes and Noble, um, Micro Center, uh, other places that sell 3D printers. Uh, they're really tired of printing bobbleheads, and they are willing to print for free if someone will just come, give them a file, and press start, and you get to collect it when it's done. So it's possible for people to engage in this without actually having a 3D printer at all. So uh, just to make time, because we were have about a half hour left. Um, how do we start working? If you have questions, that's great. We'd love to answer them. Uh, feel free to come to any of us and ask. Um, but for now, if you want to kind of break up the groups, and then if you guys have questions, we'll, we'll bounce around to, uh, to help out. Um, and if anyone is interested in the big data project with the printer torture test, um, there are, that would be a small scale version of big data that we could do with Microsoft, and then do the big version data with the uh, anonymized data from the um, people who received these over the past five years. So if you're interested in that, please send me that little table right there. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, so I guess we can move in for